scripture this morning is from Revelation 21, and it is verse 1 to 7. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be with his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. And he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of water of life without payment." The one who conquers will have this heritage, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. Thank you, Laura. Let's all bow our heads in prayer, everybody. Father, thank you this morning for your word which guides us through life. And Lord, even as we are reading the end of the scriptures of the Bible, God, we thank you, God, that just for the promise that we are your sons and daughters, that we who uh, stay steadfast in you, Lord God, have everything that we need to win we thank you, Lord, that as we open our hearts towards you, we hear the voice of our champion, Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, everyone said amen. Can you say hi to a few people around you? Introduce yourself before you take a seat. Go ahead and take a seat, everyone. Uh, for those of you who haven't had the chance to meet, my name is Nelly. I'm the senior pastor here at Every Nation Brisbane. Uh, here at Every Nation Brisbane, we have two locations. Uh, one here uh, in our central uh, of our city, and then one out in Logan in Woodridge. Can we give it up for those who are here for the first time or second time? Welcome. We want to welcome you here. So blessed you could join us here this morning. Uh, we're actually at the end of this series that we've just started with uh, the rest of our spiritual family across the world. For those of you who are relatively new here to Every Nation um, Brisbane, Every Nation Brisbane is a part of the Every Nation family of churches and ministries across the world that exists to honor God by establishing Christ-centered, spirit-empowered, and socially responsible churches and campus ministries in every nation. Over the next few weeks, we'll talk about our vision and values and what we're about. Uh, but today, we're going to end our series called Set Apart, which we're going through with our spiritual family across the world. Um, over 500 churches in 80 nations. We're all going through this series together. It just helps for us to be on the same page in terms of what God is doing in our movement of churches and ministries. So uh, the message title today is Holiness Completed. For those of you who uh, have the capacity to, I want to encourage you to take notes because there's going to be a lot of uh, scriptural breakdown in order for us to really attain what God has for us this morning. When I think about completion, when I think about finishing, when I think about ending well, I think about sports, to be honest. Some of us might think about, I'm a musician myself, might think about uh, singing competitions like Australian Idol or The Voice. You know, will they turn their chair around? Uh, but I was just thinking earlier this week um, about sports specifically. Uh, today actually marks the start of the NRL season uh, with the Broncos playing today. Go Broncos. Uh, but I was just thinking about the end of a season uh, earlier this week. For those of you who may be a little unaware as to American sports, because American sports are always interesting. Uh, earlier this week was the Super Bowl uh, on the screen right now. For those of you who are watching online, and those of you who are here, this is a man by the name of Patrick Mahomes, who is the greatest uh, quarterback of this generation, okay? There's a lot of argument now as to whether he has the trajectory to be as great as one Tom Brady. Uh, they defeated the Kansas City Chiefs, which is his team and not Taylor Swift's team. His team uh, <laughs> Uh, defeated my San Francisco 49ers. The reason why I say San Francisco 49ers is that I have an uncle who played for the Niners back in the 90s and won a, a few Super Bowls back then. So as a family uh, on my mom's side, we were told, hey, 
uncle's playing for the Niners, so you have to support the Niners. Okay, so, so since the 90s, I've been a fan of the Niners, and we almost made it. We did well. I'm actually proud of the team. Uh, but I was just thinking about it because when you win the Super Bowl, you're kind of deemed the world champion. Uh, but I'm, I was thinking about it, like, do we even play gridiron or American football here? Um, I think about how, you know, if you win the NBA championship, uh, you're deemed the world champions of basketball or uh, baseball, right? Uh, in baseball in the United States, the top level uh, league is called the, the major league. And if you get to the finals, it's called the World Series. But there is no other uh, countries that can participate in the World Series, only the U.S. and Canada that can participate in it. So I often think about how we can claim to be world champions, but we're not opening it up to. So it'll be like us, right, having the AFL world champions, uh, and yet you're all from Melbourne. So it's just, it's just really interesting, I think. But I was just thinking about how much... Discipline it takes to win a championship at that level. How much uh, training, how much uh, you have to diet, uh, you have to check what you eat, how you sleep. You have to sleep in these uh, chambers, right? They're, 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 they're these, uh, I don't know what they're called. Um, maybe my physios know what they're, they're, they're called. These, uh, these chambers that they sleep in, like stand up like vampires, and they're, they're kind of like encapsulated in this thing so that they come out feeling younger than they did when they went to sleep. I'd love for one of those machines. Anyway, I was just thinking about just the cost of what it takes to become a champion. There's a lot of work that goes into it. And then there's a lot of spectatorship. A lot of people come to watch you play or watch you participate in whatever the sport is that you uh, participate in. Some of us might be even more interested in, uh, in the band that plays uh, during the halftime of the Super Bowl than we are in the actual game. Um, but I was just thinking about the Super Bowl, right, the, and how it had sold out. They sold out the whole stadium. Um, but I heard the story of this man who was seated in the Super Bowl. On average, the average uh, seat at the Super Bowl costs 12000 U.S. dollars. Crazy, right, to, to just get a seat at the Super Bowl. And so there's the story of this man who was seated, and he found an empty seat next to him. He was wondering why that seat was empty. And so he's talking to the man who was on the other side of the empty seat, and he's like, this seat is not mine. Is it yours? And that man said, yeah, it's actually my seat. Uh, I usually watch the Super Bowl every year with my wife. But my wife has passed away. So there's such a sadness in his heart. And I was, I'm so sorry to hear this. Um, but shouldn't you have gotten a loved one, like maybe a best friend or a cousin, or a brother, or a sister, or a mom, or dad, to come and take this seat, because you're wasting the seat, it's 12,000 US dollars, shouldn't you have gotten a loved one to take the seat, and he said, no, no, they're all at his, her funeral, that's a really, all right, all right, we'll move on, we'll move on, <laughs> that was a dad joke, for those of you who are catching up, all right, Ah. Uh, Let's move on. Let's move on. 1 Corinthians chapter 9 <laughs> says, Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Turn to somebody, encourage them, got to get the prize. Okay. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Now, this is the Apostle Paul writing this, and he's writing this to an audience that is familiar with the ancient Olympic Games and what we call the Isthmus Games, where there were a lot of races run during what would be the ancient form of what we currently know as the Olympic Games. Now, in order for them to win back then as it is now, there's strict training that's required. Here's the thing. When we read about allegories of what this Christian journey is like, it's often compared to a race. This is one example, 1 Corinthians 9. Um, Paul would later go on to write in 2 Timothy chapter 4, I have fought the good fight, I have kept the faith, and I have finished the race. So there's this allegory that constantly appears throughout Scripture. Ephesians, he describes uh, walking as a Christian like an athlete, training. So all throughout Scripture, we've got to understand that Walking this journey as a person of faith is like 
training for a race that you have been called to win. Okay? This is the inevitable end for each of us. It's just a matter of if we're running in such a way as to win. And so what we read or what um, Laura read for us is actually the second to last chapter of the Bible. It's from the second to last chapter. And here's the promise. If we stay steadfast in running this race towards God, we see this picture from Revelation 21. And it gives us a picture of what the race looks like when it's completed. And it motivates us, it should motivate us to press on despite the obstacles. Now I'm going to give you three highlights here. And these three points highlight what is promised for us if we will stay in the race and finish well. Here's the three things that he promises us upon completion of the race. Firstly, he promises us a new creation and a new city. Secondly, he promises that he will dwell with us. And then thirdly, he promises that we overcome and we win. Okay, so there's your three points. I'm giving them to you so you have a journey and you're able to journey with me as we go through the scripture today from Revelation 21. So the first one is that we are a new creation and a new city. Let me highlight this by just talking about what life was like right at the start of creation. There was Adam and Eve. You're familiar with them. We started the series talking about Adam and Eve, the first man and the first woman. They were God's royal representatives called to harness the creation's potential for the glory of God and the good of creation. Let me read that again because this is not just Adam and Eve's call. This is what you've been called to do as a follower of Jesus. Adam and Eve were God's royal representatives called to harness the creation's potential for the glory of God and the good of creation. So the the result should look like a cultivated earth filled with worship and God's glorious presence. But obviously we know when we get to Genesis chapter 3, humanity falls, right? Man's sin delays the fulfillment of God's intentions. God always had this intention for this to be multi-generational, but it, start, it stops with the first generation. Adam and Eve sin. And since then, we have, as a human Race or humanity across the world have been bowing our knee at the altars of smaller gods, whether it's relationships, whether it's careers, whether it's finances, whether it's at the altar of things that are not necessarily bad, but it's bad that we that we have idolized these things. So Jesus fulfills them, all of these things, through the gospel of his life, his death, his burial, his resurrection, his ascension, and his promised. Return. How many of you believe with all your heart that Jesus is coming back? And he's coming back for this, for the new creation and the new earth, and the new heaven and the new earth. Here, here we go. Revelation 21, verse 1. It says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for I saw the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Why is it passed away? Because it's full of sin and evil. And the sea was no more. Why has the sea passed away as well? Well, the sea, if you read the entirety of Revelation, if you read Revelation 13, the sea is the place of which the beasts dwell, the beasts of evil. There being no sea means means that there's no place for evil to dwell. Just in case you are wondering, why is there no sea? I like the sea. No, the sea is representative of the place where the Leviathans and the beasts of uh, of Revelation 13, you all remember the 666 at the end of Revelation 13. Those beasts have no place to dwell because there is no sea. And I saw the holy city, a new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Now, the reason why I mentioned Genesis is because we've got to look at the start, and then we've got to look at the finish, and then we've got to look at how they connect. At the start, We have God's perfect provision within that city, within that garden. Also, we have God's perfect relationships within the garden. So God has relational perfection there. He has provisional perfection within the garden. Relationship with God, relationship with one another. I love how at the beginning we have the garden 
And at the end, because now that we've multiplied as a people, it's not just Adam and Eve anymore. Adam and Eve bore children, and before you knew it, the earth was populated. So children became households, and households multiplied and became cities. So it starts in a garden, became a city, which was old in nature, and we'll get to the reason as to what happens in that city without God as its center becomes evil and corrupt. But here's what God does is God creates a new heaven and a new, new city, a new city. So it starts in a garden, it ends in a city. That's why I live in Mount Gravatt, right? Garden city. All right. Anyway, what I want us all to know, come on, dad jokes, is, is that it started with a wedding with Adam and Eve. Not, you know, the way that we conceptualize wedding. I didn't get to see the invitations. It was J-Lo, the wedding planner. I'm not talking about that kind of wedding. What I'm talking about is the consummation and the, the relationship of intimacy with a husband and a wife become one at the start of the garden, right? Right at the start. And it ends with the marriage. You're, 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 you're seeing this? I need you all to understand that it's going to end with a wedding. It's not all of us being singular brides. It's not... Reverend Sun Young Moon. This is, this is all of us collectively as the body of Christ becoming the bride of Christ, and he is our perfect groom. So it starts with relational perfection in the wedding that was between Adam and Eve and also Adam and Eve towards God. And it's going to end that way as well. This relational connection and depth of relationship that is perfect towards one another and towards God. This has always been God's intent for creation. So Genesis 1 and 2 describes creation and then it implies a broad range of cultural activities because as we see in Genesis 4, later we see the emergence of tool making, musical instruments, the care of animals and stewardship. So the culture is created within a city, much like a culture is created within our city of Brisbane. There is a culture that happens, culture, uh, cultural Culture literally means the way you naturally do things. If the environment has created, a culture is formed, and a culture is formed by repeatedly doing the same things over and over again. You go into different countries, and they have cultures because the, the way that the infrastructure and the way that the language and the way that everything is set up forms a culture. And so this is the culture of what happens early in creation. But because God is not at the center The culture is formed of sinful pursuits. And so the population grows in Genesis 4 to the point where by the time we get to Genesis 5, God looks upon creation, sees how evil it is, and then Noah emerges and the flood happens. It's because there's been such a culture created of such sinfulness that it eventually causes just such a a disruption in the way that God initially intended for the city to exist. The thing, the, the fact of the matter is, is that it hasn't stopped today. When we look at cities like the, the big three here on the, on the southeast, Brisbane, Sydney, and Melbourne, you think about per capita, the crime rates that are within these cities are far above rural areas. And I'm talking about the, the crime rates when it uh, alludes to violent crime and property crime in particular. Uh, And it's not too distant from when you look at any cities around the world as opposed to rural areas. Why? Because there's a concentration of people within these spaces. And people naturally have created a culture of self-focus. And so there's this kind of a self-centeredness that causes you to take whatever it is to make sure that self is exalted. And sometimes at the cost of those around you because you don't value other people the way that God would have you value them. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. And so what we see here is that when you look at statistics, say in the United States, which are not far off from that which lies here in in Australia, that property crime, for instance, and violent crime in urban areas is per capita, not just because there's more people, 121% more violent crime in urban areas than there are in rural areas. And then when it regards to property crime, it's it's upwards of like three to four times that of rural areas and rural communities. And these statistics are 
the same across the world, not just in Western nations, but across all the nations. There is more violent and property crime in cities worldwide. Why? Because God is not the focus. God is not lifted up. And when he's lifted up, we begin to live by the way that he's designed us. And this is why he brings up this idea of the new Jerusalem. And he's not speaking specifically, although there is some allusion to it when you look at all the way from Genesis. He's not speaking specifically to the the city in Israel. But Jerusalem literally means, in Hebrew, the place of peace. That God's idea now that Jesus has died for the redemption of all of creation is to see Jerusalem throughout every city. For every city, much like our city of Brisbane, to be restored back to his original intent. He didn't just save us just to save us. He saved us, like Galatians 5.1 says, it is for freedom that he set you free. To see his kingdom come in Brisbane as it is in heaven. So God designates Jerusalem as his earthly dwelling place. And God designates Brisbane as his earthly dwelling place. God designates your campus. God designates UQ, come on, as his earthly dwelling place. God designates your school. God designates Kuparu. God designates Logan City. God designates Moreton Bay as his earthly dwelling place. This is God's design. And this is his promise, that he envisions a time when we will be one with God and one with one another. And this is the new Jerusalem, the city that we all long for. Back to Paul, he writes, you all remember this, right? 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. If you are in Christ, you are a new creation or new creature. You all remember that? The old has gone and the new has come. Now, we can read that scripture and easily think he's talking just about me. But I want you to read who that church, the church I want you to read who that letter is for. It's not just for you as an individual. He's writing in 2 Corinthians to the church at Corinth. He's talking about new creation happening when we walk together as the church, when we walk together in relationship when we walk together in love for one another, which is a sign to the lost and those who don't know him, that they shall know us by the fruit of our love for one another. The old has gone and the new has come. You want to get a glimpse of that new heaven and that new earth and the new city and the new creation? We need to start loving one another. That's what it looks like to see heaven on earth. Pastor Nelly. I don't know where to start. Start in your home. Start by loving the people that you live with every day. Oh, Lord, I, I, I love you, and I love, you know, I love uh, that guy over there. I hardly know him, so I'm not, it's, not, it's not easy to be offended by him. But it's, oh, man, my wife, Lord, I just, you know, just struggling there. You know, why don't you just start with the people that are in your immediate vicinity. Start by seeing and believing God for heaven in your home. For heaven, to a glimpse of heaven in the way that you learn to love one another. I don't know how to do that. You, you, what you do is you, you get close to God, which brings me to the second point, is that he dwells with us. This, this is the most important part. He dwells with us. This is the burger meat in the buns. The other two are the buns. This is the burger meat. Some of y'all are hungry for lunch, so I'll make this quick, all right? This is an extraordinary promise that God will live with former sinners, Now, I'm changing my vocabulary a little bit. Not that there's anything wrong with it, but just my own personal take on it. Because I used to say that I'm a sinner saved by grace, and theologically that's correct. But in my own heart, I don't want to identify with being a sinner. I'd rather say that I'm saved by grace as a former sinner rather than saying I'm a sinner saved by grace because it alludes to there's the possibility that it may happen again. But hey, if he dwells in me and with me, The desire for anything else is not strong. In fact, it's weakened. God lives with us as former sinners. 
cleansed, sanctified, and now conforming us into his image. This has always been the intent from Genesis 1. Let us make man and woman in our image. If we are to be imaged with Christ, then we should understand that we need to dwell with him. To dwell means to live in him, to remain in him. Your house is your dwelling. Do you live with him? Or is it an occasional visit, an hour and a half on a Sunday morning? Is this the only time you're aware of dwelling with God? Or are you aware with him as you're going to school? Or are you aware with him throughout your day at work? This should be the awareness that he dwells with us. And this is why, I need you to understand the allegory here. This is why he calls us his bride. The intention was not just the wedding. When you marry somebody, the plan is you've got to live with them and be one with them, right? Just in case you were wondering, okay, this, is, this sounds like a romantic comedy where we all become this beautiful bride like Julia Roberts and we're just walking down the aisle and, and, the, and the end of this aisle is, is, is that perfect groom. No, it, it, the, this movie doesn't end with the wedding. It begins with the wedding because it's a new city, new heaven, new earth, so we get to live with him. Have you noticed that in romantic comedies, they always end with the wedding and don't start with the wedding? Because the real life happens after the wedding. Can I get an amen from some married people in here that know a little bit something about some marriage and stuff? My marriage is good, just in case you all are wondering. All right. (laughs) Verse 3 to 5, it says, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them. What a privilege to have him with us, right? As their God, he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain, for the former things have passed away. Can't wait for that time. Some of us are walking through struggles and pain right now. The promise of heaven is that as we continue to fight to dwell with him, and remain in him, that there is coming a time, whether in this life or Christ returns, that we will come to a place where there is no longer any pain, no longer any tears, no pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Turn to somebody, encourage them this morning. He's making all things new. I need you to do what the scripture says here. And he also said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. The reason why, just a practical tip, I encourage you every Sunday to take notes, is because the memorability of what you attain, trust me, this is not just me talking to you. I I, I believe that a lot of what I'm saying is directly Correlated from the scriptures, it's God wanting to speak to you, these truths. The memorability is a lot stronger if you write things down. That's why the scriptures say here, write this down, because this is important. You're going to need to stand on this when you're going through hard times. Don't take attendance on a Sunday casual, casually. Like when you receive a prophetic word or when you receive the word of God, take it, soak in it, like try to get it in your spirit. Don't be like the thorny bushes in Mark 4 that get the word strangled out. Why? Because you don't have the strength of of obtaining the word of God and then having it so strong in you that it's not able to be strangled by the thorns. So I, I love this about this scripture. It says, I'm making all things new. Nothing's going to be the same as it formerly was. In this weary and troublesome world, there is a hope that we have in Christ. But the best thing of all is that we get to enjoy God. I highlighted this in the first service, you know, the Great Commission, which is God's instruction through Jesus about discipleship. It's Christ's final words in Matthew chapter 28. Because we often forget the first part and the last part. Jesus says to his disciples, there's 11 of them, because Judas is no longer with them. And he says to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. This is Christ talking. 
So if he has all authority, how much authority does that give us? Quick maths. <laughs> Big shack. Zero. That means if he has everything, you have nothing. But here, here's what he says, right? Therefore, go and make disciples of every nation, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey. Obey you? No, obey Christ. And lo, oh, and. I will be with you always to the end of the age. That's the part we forget. See, if you forget the part of the commission which says, I will be with you always to the end of the age, the one with the authority, then what we end up doing is two things. Number one, it's not discipleship. It's cloning because they become a lot more like you. And then secondly, you move out of a performative spirit rather than understanding the power of the grace that drives you to be able to do what God's called you to do. Because he's with you. The one with all the authority empowers you to be a disciple and to make disciples. Which brings me to the last point. I love this. His encouragement is for us to dwell with him. And because we are in him and because he is in us, we overcome and we win. I need you all to get that in your spirit. We overcome and we win. Whatever you're facing right now, we are going to overcome and we will win only if you dwell in him. That's the caveat. That's like not just a caveat. That's the main point. If you are in him, you will win. If you are not in him, you're going to lose. There's only two options. It's not like a kind of sort of. It's called lukewarm, right? So to remain in him. It doesn't mean we have to be perfect. So the righteous man falls seven times, he gets back up. There's a, there's a following after him. There's a the fervency in our chase and our pursuit of him. Do you have that in you? And so the scripture finishes off by saying, and he said to me, it is done. Everybody say, it is done. It's finished. I am the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. It's only done when he says it's done. To the thirsty, I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. What's this alluding to? Who's the author of Revelation? It's the Apostle John. John wrote earlier in his gospel, John chapter 4, about this encounter that Jesus had with the Samaritan woman at the well. She was out there at an hour that usually women wouldn't be out there. But she didn't care about her reputation. She's just desperate to get her water and go. She just didn't care about what people thought. But Jesus saw her, had compassion on her, and he talked to her about this water. You're going to drink from this water and you'll be thirsty again. You'll be here again trying to fill your thirst. But I'm here to tell you that I have a water that if you partake of this water, you'll never be thirsty again. And she's all like, give me this water. Where's it bottled at? Where's the spring that it comes from? It's a Coca-Cola or Pepsi that bottles it. I want to know, where, where does it come from? And he's like, no, 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 no factory. And I'm not talking about physical water. I'm talking about drinking or tasting and seeing that the Lord is good. Once you taste the Lord, everything else tastes like rubbish in comparison to the Lord. And she's all worried about, do I need to worship here? Do I need to go there? My ancestor is Jacob. And this is often what religion does is we start to claim things. I went to this church. I did this course. I was over here during this. I went on this missions trip. And Jesus is like, no, no, no. I don't need any of that. The true worshipers worship me in spirit and in truth. Spirit meaning that I dwell with him. He is one with me. God is spirit. And those who worship me, worship me in spirit and in truth. The truth is the word of God, who he is. So we discipline ourselves because we understand that there's a race that God's called us to run. How idiotic would it be of me to wake up tomorrow morning and go, you know what? I feel like I'm going to run a marathon today. So I put on my shoes and put on my shorts. You, you all know I didn't train for no marathon. So when Paul says, you'll, you'll do that for a crown that is temporal, for the things of this world, why don't we do that when it comes to spiritual matters? To run this race, to win it and do well. Jesus is the finish line. I love the song, John Mark McMillan's song, where he says that we are his portion. 
and he is our prize. For some of us to hear that lyric, we go like, oh, I don't want that prize. I want the stuff that God will give me. Give me a husband. Give me a, some money. Give me a career. But I don't need him. I just need his stuff. You're, you're seeing this? That's not the race. That's like running a marathon and running after the guy who holds the water on the sides. And then when he's, he, has, he gives you the cup of water, you drink and go, oh, can I get some more water? And you run after the water guy rather than finishing the race that God intended for you to finish. That water will make you thirsty again. I'm not talking again about literal water, but that degree. Oh, it's not enough degrees. I need more degrees. I need more degrees than Fahrenheit. Oh, I need to win this championship. Oh, I need to get this career. I need to upgrade this. I need to upgrade my wife or my husband, you know, like upgrading everything. And you'll never be satisfied. But Jesus promises us right here that he has spring from the water of life and without payment. You don't have to pay anything. He's paid the price already. This is the race that God's called us to run. And I'm just going to end by showing you this uh, this example of a race well run, and hopefully you catch this through this, this analogy from 1968. No, I wasn't there, just in case you're wondering. In 1968, saw the uh, Olympics in Mexico City. This is John Aquari, John Stephen Aquari. So he represented Tanzania in the men's marathon, but there was a collision early in the race, and he collided with other athletes, as they were jockeying for position, and he fell to the ground, um, and he ended up dislocating his knee. I'm just going to show you a video that will explain a little bit, and hopefully you'll grasp from this example what God might be speaking to us today in more eternal form as we observe his race at the Olympics in 1968. Watch the screen. That, that statement he made, my country did not send me 5,000 miles to start the race. They sent me 5,000 miles to finish the race. And I want to echo the voice of heaven that says, I've paid the price and given you everything that you need. My power my spiritual family, the knowledge. I've given you 66 books written by 40 authors in three different continents. 
over a period of almost 2,000 years, I've given this to you. You have everything that you need to win. The Spirit of the Lord would say, finish the race. Finish what God has started. I close with this scripture from Hebrews chapter 12. It says, therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, these witnesses are those who have gone before us and have finished their race. The saints from church history, the saints who don't even get mentioned in church history. Maybe you've got grandparents who prayed for you and walked through trials and tribulations only to set you up so that you could receive the baton of faith. That great cloud of witnesses, since we're surrounded by them, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily entangles us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who, the joy, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising its shame, and has now sat at the right hand of the throne of God. Church, finish the race. Be encouraged this morning to finish what he started in you. I sense that so many of us in this room are facing trials. Maybe you feel like things are dislocated in your life. But I'm here, I'm here to just encourage you this morning that no matter what brokenness you're experiencing, we have everything we need to finish this race well. Don't go running after the water boy. Finish the race and finish strong. But we can only finish it if we walk with the one who has finished it already. So when he said at the cross to tell us die, that was to reassure you and I, that the one who we serve and the one who dwells with us has already finished the race. Let's pray. Father, thank you this morning for your presence here that reassures us that we have all that we need to finish whatever race we are running. Father, help us not to fall in this trap of comparison much like this Olympian who ran his race not to win it but to win by finishing I pray God that you will help us to run for an eternal prize, an eternal crown we pray Lord that one day we will be able to say like Paul said in 2 Timothy 4 to his spiritual son Timothy he said I have fought the good fight and I've offered myself as a drink offering I have kept the faith and I have finished the race. So with every head bowed and every eye closed, if you're in this place this morning and you're feeling a little discouraged, maybe you've experiencing, you've been experiencing just the wounding and the just different things that have caused you to maybe trip along the way. The invitation is to come. Like Jesus would say in Matthew 11, all who are weary and heavy laden, he will give us rest. Take his yoke upon us and learn from him. For his yoke is easy and his burden is light. If you're in this room today and your desire is to just see him walk with you, him run this race with you, and your desire is to surrender your circumstances to him, can I just get you just to lift your hand so I can pray for you specifically? Awesome. So I want to pray for you. I want to pray for those of you who have your hands up. We can get our prayer team to come alongside these ones who have their hands up. Just keep your hands up so we can pray for you this morning. Father, thank you for just these ones who have their hands lifted, their hearts lifted towards you. I just want to pray, Holy Spirit, that you would come and bring about a supernatural encouragement. I just sense you wanting to pour out healing, encouragement, faith for the journey. Grant us what we need to finish well. And I thank you that promise that you gave to Paul that he who began the good work in us will be faithful to complete it. Thank you, Lord, that you always finish what you start. We want to lean into you, the author and finisher of our faith. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Let's give God praise, everybody.
Hey, we're so thankful that you can join us here today at Every Nation Brisbane. We hope and pray that you were impacted deeply by God's challenge in the message or in the worship. Please do let us know how we can pray for you, uh, either in the chat or you can message us or email us at info at enbrisbane.org. Again, if you want to learn more about who we are as a church, you can also uh, interact with us on our website, uh, which is enbrisbane.org, and you'll learn more about who we are. Obviously, we're on all the socials. We're on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, Twitter. We're on all of that, and you can interact with us there or hear more uh, all about uh, what we're doing as a church. We'd love to hear from you. Let us know how we can serve you. Let us know how we can pray for you and stand with you in everything that God is doing in and through your life, no matter where you're from. We're just really blessed that you could be here. Thank you for all of you who continue to sow faithfully into our church here. If you want to learn more about how you might be able to sow, you can go onto our website at enbrisbane.org slash give, and you'll see all the information there with regards to how you might sow. We just thank you so much for continuing to sow into all that God is doing in this church and through this church into the kingdom of God here in Brisbane. And so we're really thankful that you are here with us today and we pray that you would have a blessed week ahead. Let us know how we can stand with you, stay in contact, and let's continue to walk in everything that God has for us as we honor God and we love people. Grace and peace.